Okay. Well, uh, thank you, uh, the conveners, for uh, for giving me this opportunity to uh, to uh, communicate and and with the the rest of the commun community. Uh, I, I've learned a lot in uh, from this workshop. I enjoyed the discussions and and the talks and the breakout uh, conversations. Uh, I was given I was given a uh, a difficult task to uh, summarize, and before I I. I was <laughs> I knew what was would be going on, <laughs> and and but I uh, I I, I uh, after I've uh, uh, listened to the, the talks and the discussions, I think what I guessed was uh, quite right, and uh, uh, this is a test. As, uh, I'll let you see if uh, I pass the test, and let me start with explaining my title, and the mega thrust in forty plus. Uh, 4D is quite straightforward. We've talked about uh, all along about 4D. All of these uh, speakers, they talk about different aspects in different dimensions. And, and I will go through uh, uh, these uh, uh, dimensions. And the plus is uh, no less important than the 4D. The plus is about a bigger environment, a bigger picture. And the mega thrust is a part of a complex system, the subjectional system. It's a one component, a very important component of this system. And to understand this component, you have to also understand the whole system and the role it plays in the system. It interacts with the rest of the other components of the system. And so that's why it's, it's very important. Uh, 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 in the discussions, and a lot of people have mentioned various aspects of this, uh, the plus thing. And the plus is about uh, a thermal hydrologic condition and the background stress and the mental rheology. And so I will uh, 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 go through these things first, and then I will uh, talk about the 4D, but I will not spend time to talk about the, uh, the time dimension because it'll come out naturally from all the other components as we have seen from the various uh, talks. So let's start with, uh, okay, uh, by the way, I think the, uh, uh, what, uh, from what I, I've learned, and, and uh, one thing we really need to uh, pay attention to is this dimension. The, 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 well, I'm running into the same problem that uh, John <laughs> ran into. Yeah, and, and uh, uh, yeah, that's something we really need to uh, pay uh, greater attention to. So let's start with uh, the plus. Plus one, uh, thermal petrologic condition. It is very important. A, a, to some extent, it may be first order, the, the greatest importance. And we really need to know the fault zone rheology and minerals. Then we have to know the temperature and, and, uh, and, and petrology. And we need to know the metamorphism and fluids because we need to know what materials are in the fault and how much fluid it produces. And also we need the links with the other two workshops and that's the, uh, the fluid workshop and volcano workshop and, and as, as, as in, uh, uh, integrated uh, uh, approach of this whole uh, mega thrust, uh, what uh, modeling, subduction modeling, whatever acronym, something, something, okay. You know what I mean? Uh, okay, so, but the nice thing about subtraction zone, subtraction zones, they, they all look the same. They look, look very similar. So you study one subtraction zone, you kind of understand the others. And that's, that's very nice. And all subtraction zones, uh, almost with very few exceptions, they have volcano and the volcanoes and uh, 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 roughly where the uh, located, where the, the, slab, the slab is uh, about 100 kilometers uh, depth. And with the very few exceptions, we have a very cold forearc, as cold as the uh, cratons, the coldest place on earth. And we have very hot back arc, uh, arc and bark arc, back arc. And the contrast is uh, quite uh, uh, astonishing. And the forearc is cold enough to allow hydrous minerals to survive there. And over a very short distance away, it, 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 it's hot enough to allow melts to be produced, to produce volcanoes. And so that sharp contrast is a key feature of subduction zones. And what caused that contrast, and after all these years of uh, research, now we understand the key is a change 
in the plate interface at about a depth of uh, 70 to 80 kilometers, there is a sudden change quite sharp. Below that, the mantle wedge and the slab is fully, cup fully coupled. By fully coupled, I mean the material of the mantle wedge travels with the slab. And we have no longer have a fault. It just continues deformation. And above the, all of a sudden, it, it becomes fully decoupled. And, and the company is not about earthquakes. It's just the material in the long term does not travel with the slab. And with that change, only with that change can we produce this sharp thermal contrast and many of other observations, seismic and, and uh, geological observations. And, and, and so that's uh, very important. And that also tells us our mega thrust actually has a, has a depth limit. And, uh, and all subjection rules are similar in one way. There's a back arc, arc, arc and back arc, they are more or less the same with uh, variations such site specific reasons. And the, but the, the fore arc and the mega thrust and the slab, they can be quite different. But nice thing is they are different uh, uh, systematically for a good reason, is they're not random. And they're different because of the age of the incoming plate or thermal parameter, it has to do with the, the speed of the subduction. And you have a, a young uh, a subducting plate, you have a, a warmer or slower subduction, you have a warmer condition, you have an old uh, uh, cold plate, you have a colder condition. They cause difference, a systematic difference across the whole subduction zone spectrum. Let's take two examples. Uh, well, let's, let's, let me first explain the, the reason for the difference. The reason is the, uh, because slab go through different PT conditions and they, have the, they go through different uh, metamorphic petrology. I learned all these things from Simon Peacock. If, uh, if, <laughs> if something I said is wrong, blame him. Yeah. And uh, this, uh, on this side, this is the, uh, the, the, the subducting crust. And, and all these numbers ignore the mineral, mineral well, I don't, I'm not showing mineral names. All these numbers are the, uh, 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 the water fluid, water in the minerals. And, and as you go through a certain boundary from the blue kind of yellow here, last one, the, the basalt, gabbro, uh, uh, has a transformation to uh, eclogite. And that's where the, the peak dehydration takes place. Dehydration takes place continuously, but there's the peak. And this side is the, uh, is the, uh, the, the, the the mantle part. If, you, if water gets into the mantle, or uh, it produces hydrous minerals, and it'll dehydrate after subduction. And, uh, and, and a cold and a warm slabs, they subduct, they go through different paths. As you can see immediately, for warm, subduct, warm slabs, they dehydrate earlier, right? And so the whole thing can be quite different. So let's take two uh, examples, two end member examples, to see the contrast, the, the, uh, uh, the consequence. And for, for a very warm slab here, well here, when you see blue, that's, uh, that's basalt, uh, 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 gabbro. And when, you, when, when the blue is uh, finished, and that's, that's is the transformation to eclogite, it, it's done, right, roughly. When you see a purple, that means the uh, 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 one hydrous mineral serpentine, antigorite, it uh, can be stable in that condition. It doesn't mean that the mineral has to be there. If you have enough water, uh, if mineral is produced, it can be stable in that field. That's what it means. Okay, so, and, and here, then the, the con that he, uh, and you see the, the same thing from, from heat flow, right? The, say, the thermal contrast, regardless of the, uh, the hot and cold, you have the same thermal contrast here. And the first thing is uh, the fluid, right? The dehydration, uh, there's a less fluid in the slab, and dehydration takes place uh, earlier at shallower depths. In contrast, and for a cold slab, there's a lot more fluid, and the dehydration, peak dehydration, uh, takes place at greater depths and releasing enough water and to produce, uh, uh, to cause uh, uh, melting and, uh, uh, well, yeah, and, and flux melting and produce a lot of magma. Uh, in theory, and because, because but, but, uh, uh, by the time the slab gets here, the, uh, when the mantle wedge is warm enough uh, for, for melting and there's not enough fluid, so in theory, and we expect less active uh, uh, arc, vol uh, arc volcanism. And, but there are some exceptions for other, because magma can be produced for other reasons. But uh, I think that's still generally the, uh, the trend. 
the contrast. And another important uh, uh, part, uh, aspect, important to our megathrust research is the mental wedge, a hydration of the mental wedge. And because the slab dehydration is earlier here, a lot of the, uh, fluid is released and, and to, to hydrate the wedge corner. And here, and, 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 and less water is released. So in general, the, 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 the mental wedge corner is a lot drier. So that causes a, 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 some important mechanical consequences I'll talk about later. So that's all about the, the first plus. The second plus is the, uh, the background stress. Of course, it's very important for various reasons. And uh, because of the, uh, the temperature change here and the, the temperature change along the, the interface, the mechanical behavior changes, right? And the shallower part, we have a, in general kind of frictional behavior with complications. We have, we can have a pressure solution. That, that, well, but mainly it's frictional. frictional. And, and as the temperature ri uh, uh, rises, and it changes from uh, uh, friction to, to uh, viscous uh, behavior, as uh, John described uh, uh, beautifully with uh, rocks uh, from the field. And, uh, and, uh, uh, and with this, part of the, uh, the frictional zone is, uh, oops, is our seismogenic zone. So what we want to know is the, uh, the stress. We need to know the, the absolute stress on the fault, and we need to know the stress in the plate. And the reason is we need to uh, know how the, the, the mega thrust is loaded tectonically. And uh, we need to know that the strength of the fault and how it fails. And also for a lot of the uh, dynamic modelers, we need to know the, the absolute stress, right? For a reasonable modeling. So that's all the background information we need, we need to know. And there are a, a different ways to figure out the absolute stress. One way is to study frictional heating. So by, by looking at heat flow data from different subduction zones, and uh, uh, we can model frictional heating. I will not give details, I have no time. And uh, the result is, uh, and for a lot of subduction zones, especially for subduction zones that produce large earthquakes, the e effective friction coefficient is quite low. And this number is lower than the Byerly's law with hydrostatic uh, 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 pore fluid pressure by an order of magnitude. So it's as weak as that. For, I think that's true for most subduction zones, that's from frictional heating. And uh, we can also study uh, the stress and fault strength and by considering force balance in the fore arc. And we have the fore arc, uh, the stress in the fore arc is controlled by gravity. It causes extensional stress. It causes by the coupling and pushing from the side. And the competition is the result. Because we have, we have gravity as the absolute measure, we can know the, the absolute value of other things right, on average sense. And we can, by studying stress, by studying earthquake focal mechanisms, other stress indicators, and, and after, again, after years of research, this is what we, uh, we found. And in general, the stress in the fore arc, the differential stress is quite low. It's, it, 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 it's so low that the, the stress direction, as uh, Thorsten mentioned the other day, can, rever can be reversed uh, uh, under pretty, benign perturbation, right? So it's, it's quite low, but uh, some, in some places it's more compressional, some places more extensional, but not too far from neutral. And uh, from this, we can, we can understand how much stress we need on the fault. Again, if you use a, a friction, effective friction coefficient and, and, and to represent it, it's about the same number. Totally independent study from frictional heating. And we come up with the roughly the same number. And that, but there are some exceptions. In some places, can be higher. And uh, uh, what that what <laughs> that number means? That number means the absolute stress at uh, 20 kilometers. It, oops. Now I understand your feeling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The. Uh, 
I have to be careful now. The absolute stress at 20 kilometer steps is, is about 20 megapass. But you need the effect, you can figure out the effect in normal stress, right? And, and for that's the shear stress. And talking about stress drop, if we compare it with uh, stress drop, it's, it's a fraction, it's a significant fraction, but uh, uh, a complete stress drop uh, for a large fault area is basically impossible. But it's still significant. Okay. So that's all about the second plus. The third one is, uh, is mental rheology. It is important because uh, it has to do with uh, energy uh, buildup for earthquakes, right? Earthquake cycles and the recurrence of events. It's not just about the friction and elasticity and the recurrence events has to do with uh, how the, the mental response in a viscous way. And also, and, and if you want to uh, 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 study fault behavior from surface observations, we have to understand whether that's due to a uh, fault motion or due to mental flow. Right. So we need to understand this. And for uh, talking about mental, and, and for, the, for the mental, if you study the temperature and thermal field, and, and for that time scale, the mental is viscous, right? So we use a viscous uh, whatever, rheology. And, but if you study earthquake cycles for that time scale, it becomes uh, viscoelastic. But still, in the same way, because the, uh, the, the mental wedge, we have uh, fluids, we have melts, and the viscosity is lower. And the, uh, uh, for the oceanic mantle, viscosity is usually higher. And uh, with, by considering the viscoelastic uh, property, and uh, uh, with a lot of observations, again, after years of studies, this is what we, <laughs> now we understand. And, and we understand after a large earthquake, in the subduction zone. Three things happen, right? And one is after slip, you all know very well, and after slip will cause surface deformation. To go like that. And the other is fault locking. The fault locking will cause surface to go like that. And with the viscoelastic relaxation and, and of the mantle, the surface will go like that. And the three processes they work together at the same time, but they work they, at different time scales. And the combination of the three processes at different time scales gives you a seemingly complex evolution. But that evolution is systematic. It's true for almost every, all the other subduction earthquakes. Let's take examples using a very large earth. These are giant earthquakes and, and at different times, after the, the earthquake, that's what we observe with surface uh, uh, GPS. And, and, and we see a change, and from shortly after, after earthquake, wholesale seaward motion, uh, motion to uh, a, a few decades after earthquake, opposing motion of the coastal area and inland areas. And also, a few decades later, wholesale landward motion. So that change is quite systematic. And, and, but these are for very large earthquakes. Now we know the same thing happens for smaller events as well, but they, it happens at different speed because of the, 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 the 3D geometry, mainly and the stress perturbation caused by the earthquake initially. And so we can study uh, uh, earthquakes, uh, these earthquakes large enough and have enough uh, geodetic observations. The, all the earthquakes that have enough ge ge geodetic observations for, for us to study, that's, that's it. There's uh, quite a few of them. And, and what we see is, is this, right? This pattern, assume, uh, presume you have uh, three sides. And at first, and you'll see these two sides will have opposing motion, right? That's basically offshore here. And, and then, and the site, the site will reverse direction one by one. And, and the dividing boundary of this opposing motion will move landward. And at a later time, and, and you'll see that the, uh, a, a the dividing boundary will be between these two sides. And eventually, everything will move landward. Okay, say, so, but with different earthquake sizes, earthquakes, and the speed of this change is different. And we want to measure this speed. How do we measure it? We find a location and to, to see the time it takes for that dividing boundary to pass through that location. And the convenient location we use is a 
the place where the, where the slab is uh, 50 kilometers deep. It's just convenient. You can use other locations, just convenient location. And we want to see the time that dividing boundary pass with that location. And we call this the reference time. Then we study all these earthquakes with modeling, with the geodetic observations, and this is the result. And, and the, the, for larger earthquakes, very large earthquakes, it takes decades for that to happen. For smaller events, the whole thing can be complete uh, uh, quite fast. For even smaller, for events smaller than magnitude eight, and uh, you hardly have time to uh, deploy your, 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 your instruments, it, it's done. So you have to do it very quickly, or you have, you have to have seafloor observations. Okay, so that's about the, uh, so you can see the importance, right, for, that, for earthquake, understanding of earthquake cycles. So I think I've done with the, with the plus. Now let's go, go into the 4D thing. And first, the dip, dip direction. And, and we're talking about the, from shallow to seismic to to, uh, uh, to flow transition. And the dip direction in general, and we're talking about increasing temperature, increasing pressure or normal stress, and we're talking about prograde metamorphism. We are talking about the structural smoothing, kind of maturity of the, of the fall, right? And, uh, 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 and in general, in a shallow place, and we expect a hydro, a structurally rather hydrogenous uh, falls, right? And the, the, the shear zones are, are being developed. And we have, we expect rather complex slip behavior. As we go deeper, and we expect the, uh, the, 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 fault, the fault zone to be structurally less heterogeneous. There's more smoothing and, and uh, uh, yeah, whatever ge other geological terms you want to use. And we can have a larger, large zone of shear localization that may host very large ruptures, right? Not always, but that may. As we go deeper, and, and the fault can be structurally rather heterogeneous. Uh, uh, but uh, it can be petrologically and rheologically hydrogenous for various reasons. Uh, different minerals, different fluid comes from different places. And, uh, and then you may have a smaller sizing patches and with a larger uh, spacing. So that's, gen that's the general picture here. Again, let's consider the, uh, uh, the, the end member warm and hot. Uh, again, temperature is really the first order control. And talking about the seismogenic zone, I think over the past uh, 20 something years, and there's, uh, uh, there's a general uh, 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 understanding, or at least a claim, that the, uh, if the fault zone, as we understand, most of subduction uh, megathrusts uh, is kind of a, a, a either rich or, or contains, rich in or contains quartz. If it contains quartz, and the, uh, the behavior of the, of the, <laughs> the mechanical behavior is, is pretty dominant by this quartz. In that case, and the, uh, uh, the seismogenic zone, term, oops, yeah, but, yeah, will terminate, yeah, uh, 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 at, uh, at this temperature, right, around this, this range, right, and as, as, uh, as uh, John showed from field uh, observations as well, and, uh, and, uh, 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 but, but for cold subduction, it can, it can go a, a lot deeper, but, uh, but there's, uh, as, as some people say that the continental moho uh, could be the limit, but, uh, it, but the reality is rather complicated. And uh, it's complicated for many <laughs> reasons. And it has to do with the dynamic rupture with many other things. And, but even the, uh, the, when we talk about seismic zone, and there are different ways, and, and people, different people think differently, right? When we say it is controlled by temperature, and it, it is controlled by temperature for sure. And warmer, warmer subduction zones will have the megathrust rupture at shallow place. And the colder subduction zones will have the megathrust rupture to a greater depth, that period for sure. Just the exact termination, we're not too sure. Okay, and, and but the, uh, talking about the temperature control, mainly it's, it's we're talking about the friction properties, right? From velocity strengthening, velocity weakening, and that's, that's one way to, to think about the, uh, the limit but also we can define the limit observationally, we can talk about geodetic locking, but the problem is, even if you, you can determine the true, truly mechanically locked area, the problem is all the uh, written state friction people tell us, the lock zone actually changes the time, it shrinks with time. And so what, <laughs> depending on what time you're, obser you're observing it, so that you have a problem. 
And, and, and also, when you have a real, some people use a very large earthquake, earthquake rupture, but the problem is earthquake rupture can extend into those uh, presumably seismic zones. And, and uh, some people use smaller events, as long as we have an earthquake, that's seismic zone, but smaller events can go a lot deeper. So it's, we, so it, it's, it's complicated, but the complication is not really bad news, right? It, it, it's, it's scientific problem for us to, uh, to study. But we need to keep that in mind. There's a lot of things to study. That's all about subject uh, seismogenic zone. And we need to worry about the, the shallow megathrust. Many people talk about the shallow part. And we need to uh, talk, worry about the, uh, the deeper part, the transition from the eventual, eventually to viscous behavior. Shallow part first. And uh, uh, to study shallow part, in addition to, uh, to the understanding the, the, the physics and, and other things, and uh, the applied aspect important to society is tsunami generation, right? And it, the, the shallow behavior of the fault and has to do with uh, how large tsunami it can, the earthquake can generate, right? And the, the tsunami can be generated in different ways. It can be generated with, uh, with, uh, with a buried rupture you don't have to break anything to the surface. You can still raise the sea floor to generate tsunami. You can have uh, a splay fault like that. You can have uh, a trench breaking rupture, like uh, presumably what happened in the Tohoku earthquake and the sloping sea floor, the motion of that will raise all water. And we have a lot of sediment here. You can have a uh, rather complex because the, the fault has to find a way to, uh, if it wants to go to surface, it has, has to find a way to do it, right? And so all these uh, 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 observations, they are potentially useful to help to understand, expect what might happen in the, in the, in the, in the place with a lot of sediments. And uh, so, yeah, yeah so that's, that's, that's the, uh, the, the uh, structural aspect complications here. And so I think uh, uh, there's a lot to say, but I, I am not in position to explain uh, more details. I'm, I'm here to summarize. But what I want to point out is, is the, uh, the lack of knowledge uh, of the, uh, the update part and the, uh, it, mainly because of offshore. It's difficult to observe, right? Just take one example. That's the Tohoku earthquake, the best recorded observed earthquake. And we have, uh, this is a compilation of all the published models. If you draw a profile here, that's just the, 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 the slip predicted by these models by inversion, by inverting the massive data. Yeah, geodetic, seismological, tsunami data. And, but if you take a subset, and that is, uh, if you take the, the models, inversion models that used seafloor data, seafloor geodetic data. There's a few, there were a few seafloor stations there before the earthquake. And, uh, and also, if you, you throw away the models that use uh, just a planar fault, the subset is a lot better. If you, if you, if you ignore one of the models here, you see that the spread is, is smaller here, right? So it, it is better. So we, we do have hope. The problem is, if you go further offshore, and here, near the trench, like within 50 kilometers, and, and it's still a mess. And that problem will never be resolved because the opportunity is gone. We, we just didn't have data, right? No matter what we do. So when I see this, I'm really humbled. I'm worried. And, and no, no matter how uh, 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 powerful our models are, we do not have enough observations to constrain our models. So, uh, so uh, when I see this, I, I, I really want to get on, get on the ship, join the crew to help people deploy uh, uh, stations. And, and, and so, so that also uh, uh, tells us, and we need to work with people who make observations. And we, to, uh, to, to have important scientific findings, we don't need a lot of massive observations. We need critical, good observations. And where to find critical observations and, and people who make observations, they really, they, they, well, they, they, their expertise is not in this field. They don't really know. They need you, right? They need modelers to tell them, tell me the most critical point. If you had put three stations instead of 100 stations, I can understand important science. 
that's your job. So you need to interact with the people who make observations. You can see my observation uh, friends, and they often see me in their meetings, right? <laughs> I, so I, I attend their meetings more than I attend modelers' meetings. Because I, 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 when I see this, I, I see the importance. Yeah, we just need good observations. Okay, so that's about the shallow part. Let's move on to the deeper part of the mega thrust, the transition. Again, temperature and deeper part. And let's start with the, uh, the warm uh, uh, slab case. And, and the warm slab, as, as I said, uh, the metal wedge corner is, uh, is hydrated and the cold slab is not the case. That is seen by people who made observations, <laughs> seismologists, they find by, by analyzing wave speed, uh, size and velocities, they could uh, infer the uh, degree of hydration. And uh, this is a global compilation and, 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 uh, and also based on some calculation. When you see red, that means the, the mantle wedge is uh, fully hydrated, high degree. So when you see blue, it's, uh, it's pretty dry. And, and there are three places that's red. These are our typical uh, end member warm slab subjective Nankai, Cascadia, and Mexico. So we'll come, come back to these three places. But first, let's see what happens in this uh, warm slab subjective zones at the mental edge corner. Uh, as I said, there's a, a fluid keeps coming, right? And, and the fluid will hydrate the mental edge. And because the, the volume is not, it's not a lot of volume here. It doesn't take a long time to fully to saturate it with, uh, say, with serpent wind and can have other hydrous minerals. When it's fully saturated, you can seal all the cracks and everything. And, and, and then, and the fluid will have difficulty to, to, to flow. It has to flow up, up dip. The problem is when it flows up dip, it deposits other things, right? And so you have a deposit silica, and, and then you have a seal, right? Around mental edge corner, you have a seal, permeability seal, and, and the fluid keeps coming. You have a very high profit pressure. And, uh, and uh, uh, so that uh, becomes interesting problem. And the, uh, is, uh, you see the, uh, uh, without, oops. Without all these uh, 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 complications and, and the, 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 the megathar is supposed to, to change from frictional to viscous behavior. That, part is supposed to be viscous, just, just creep quietly without producing any noise, any jerky motion. But that's not the case. I think we think because the, uh, when you have a lot of fluid and the, uh, 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 the, the, the frictional strength becomes much lower, even lower than viscous strength, and it begin to have some frictional behavior. And the frictional behavior with other arguments and uh, uh, will give, you, give rise to uh, this kind of uh, ETS behavior, slow slip and with tremor. And, uh, and the, uh, so that, that would be the change if introduce a lot of, oops. If you introduce a, a very high profit pressure locally, you can have a, a friction and viscous or semi viscous and back to frictional behavior. In between, and that, that's where in some places we have long term uh, slow slip events. And the, the argument can be complicated, but don't worry, but the key is, uh, is uh, the whole thing happens because the seismogenic zone terminates before it reaches the mental wedge. And that happens in the, the, the three warm slabs, subjective zones we, we, we saw in the other. Uh, compilation, right, and where the, the mental wedge is uh, fully hydrated. That also means if you consider, uh, take into consideration of uh, temperature, rheology, petrology, and observations from other places, and, and you probably can, can predict the megathrust rupture at Cascadia does not go to ETS. Okay, and that's about the worms warm slab subtraction zone and, and a cold slab here. And, and, and it, it, the rupture, the, 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 the seismogenic zone can go all the way. It just ignores the elemental wedge. And, uh, but still, it, certainly in, in, in Japan trench, there's no ETS. There's a tremor in the shallow areas. 
but no ETS around mental edge corner. And for most other cold slab subterranean, there's just no ETS. So it's a different, different process. However, uh, strange things do happen in the deep end. Things we really don't understand. For example, you know this very well. And before the Tokyoki earthquake, there was a, seem to be from independent studies, kind of a accelerated slip. You call it a, a slow slip event or something. Accelerated slip down dip of the future rupture. Something we don't really understand. And, and more strange things happen in the down dip end. As I mentioned, the, uh, for Chile, we're in the face of opposing motion now, right? And the data were from uh, that period around the turn of the century, right? So we, we, we do see this, and we expect, expect that to last for a long time. And, but re more recent data is a bunch of observations in this time frame. They show a different uh, picture. It's, it's the difference is not because uh, a reference frame, it's an identical reference frame, and different picture. And the picture is, is this. Between these two periods, the difference, this velocity difference is, is this much. All of a sudden, there's a faster landward motion. And that means the, and, and from the, uh, the only continuous, long-lived continuous site, we see that change happened very fast. So almost all of a sudden, and 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 that means the that that uh, that opposing motion, and and suddenly that 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 the boundary moved landward very quickly all of a sudden prematurely, and with a viscoelastic elastic relaxation that would have lasted until uh, maybe another 40, 50 years, right? But now we see it's already happened. So what happened? It cannot be explained by viscoelastic relaxation. That's the viscoelastration prediction for that site, right? And so the only choice we have is uh, something happened in the mega thrust down dip of the lock zone. And so this is a simple model to illustrate if you do have uh, some uh, enhanced locking down dip of the of the uh, the, the the original lock lock zone here, and we can have uh, all this uh, sudden increase. So that's something we don't have a clue uh, <laughs> what happened, just at, like we don't have a clue what happened before Tokyo earthquake. So it could accelerate, it could enhance locking. I think we heard a similar story from Roland Bergman uh, in Southern California, right? So, uh, no, uh, no, uh, no, Southern, uh, Northern California, Southern uh, Cascadia. Yeah, it's a similar story. Yeah, also even similar depth. And the interesting thing is, and that's the tremor distribution. It seemed to, uh, <laughs> there seemed to be some consistent pattern there. Okay. Okay, so we have a lot of questions for the down dip direction. I don't know if I should read it, but uh, let's go it quickly. And how common does the trench breaching rupture occur? That's the, uh, that's the, uh, the, the shallow segment uh, store energy between earthquakes. And how do structure and sediment composition affect shallow slip and tsunami genic rupture? What controls the down dip limit of the seismogenic zone? And a classical question. And how uh, do large and small earthquakes have different down dip rupture limits and why? Uh, how does the state of uh, a deep locking change with time? Why? As we see in different places, very, very strange behavior. And what is the nature of the uh, frictional viscous transition? I raised the problem, question, right? And how does the PT condition control, control meta, uh, typo here, control metamorphic uh, petrology in, uh, 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 controlled, oh, not typo, uh, controlled metamorphic petrology affect slip behavior? So all these questions are, are, are open. The next dimension, uh, I think it's, it's probably something we, we've missed a lot, is the, in, the, in, the, in the thickness uh, dimension, uh, fault zone structure and, and material. Uh, uh, in seismology, we have a view of a fault, right, with patches of different uh, frictional behavior. But geologists view it differently. To them, the fault is uh, 3D. It has internal structure. It, it's, uh, 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 but, uh, uh, 
Yeah, but so, so, so that's something we need to appreciate. We've learned a lot about the fault from strike sleep faults, fault behavior. What we learned is uh, this uh, like textbook uh, uh, scenario is uh, we, have a, we have a principal uh, slip zone that can produce earthquakes. Now we have fault core with fine grained uh, uh, cataclysis. And, and when we move away, we have a damage zone and, and then eventually country rock. And so that's the, 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 the traditional uh, fault uh, structure. But even for strike, strike slip faults, we have surprises. The recent earthquake this year and reach crest earthquake and ignore the first earthquake, the, the second one last year, the, the faults that have been activated have been seen in the field <laughs> by geologists after the earthquake. And so we see uh, multiple fault trends in one earthquake. And this is really not new, not, not new from recent observations, right? But for, for, for these faults to be really in close, close by spacing, and that's quite interesting. For, so even for, for seemingly simple strike slip fault, we have complications like that. And for mega thrust, talking about being scary, and this is how geologists view megathrust, very different from we view megathrust. And, and so megathrust have a different uh, potential slip zones, like the roof thrust and basal thrust, and, uh, and, and different, uh, the sediment can get into the fault zone, and rocks from the upper plate, rocks from the ongoing plate can get entrained in the fault, in the fault zone and to form melange. And the melange, melange zone will have a structure. And if you look into detail, I, I, I think everybody in this room should re really read this paper. It's pretty easy to read, short paper. And you see the, how the fault zone structure in the, in the simplified way, how it's structured. And we see a, we see a different uh, discrete faults. We see strands of localized shear. And we see, a, 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 in general, a, a, a fault zone of a few hundred meters thick that can, have, can shear, right? And it doesn't matter whether it's seismogenic zone or, or, or above the seismogenic zone, right? It, it's just like that. And, uh, and take it one example, this is a shallow, shallow, the very shallow end. That's the Tohokoki uh, JFAST drilling, the core from JFAST drilling. And that core shows there are discrete faults here. They certainly slip. Discrete, and maybe they slip all of a sudden in earthquakes. And but, but adjacent, and these things, we have a scaly fabric. Scaly fabric typically indicates some kind of uh, more ductile, slower deformation. So that's the, the complication here. And, and, and from, uh, from the, the literature and from the geological literature, and, and there's uh, increasingly uh, frequent reports of uh, multiple multi-mode deformation in the megathrust fault zone. So from this example, we see the coexistence of discrete faults and scaly fabric. And so that, that some people would say that's the cool frictional viscous transition. Cool meaning temperature here. Not <laughs> uh, and, and also from other publications, we see the coexistence of pseudotoclite and myelinite. Pseudotoclite is, uh, is an indicator for earthquake rupture, right? And myelinite is usually is uh, more ductile. And, uh, and we have uh, multiple strands of uh, 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 localized and distributed shear in fault zone. And we have coexistence of brittle failure and pressure solution, this is great, right? And that, we have to think about uh, the geology of slow slope events and tremor. And, and, and there's, uh, so that, that's about uh, a fairly organized fault zone structure, but it can be more complicated and uh, 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 it can be rather disorganized. If you have a very large geometric anomaly subducting, it can cause a mass. And that mass can, can creep and can, yeah, can cause a, a shear zone, cata cataclysic shear zone. It quite, can be quite complex. And, uh, and if, if that happens, the, uh, that kind of uh, uh, creep is against uh, a lot of resistance and uh, they, they, you have to do more work and to produce more heat. So that's what we see from frictional heating and faults like that with uh, a lot of very rough seafloor subducting, they actually produce more heat. So the inferred uh, friction coefficient from frictional heating is actually larger. So these creeping faults can be stronger. That's why we call it a strong creep. 
So there's a bunch of uh, thickness direction questions. And how does internal structure of fault zone evolve uh, with time? And the role of sediment accretion, uh, tectonic erosion, underplating, melange formation. And how does the, uh, the, the morphology and sediment of incoming seafloor affect megathrust fault zone structure? And how do different degrees of shear localization in different parts of fault zone affect the seismogenesis and general slip behavior? Can the megathrust earthquake involve multiple slip bands? And that uh, do SSEs and tremor occur along a fault plane or in the zone of a finite thickness? Good question, right? And how does ETS occur in a high temperature environment? It's pretty strange. And how do we ex extrapolate laboratory experiments to the real megathrust? What, would, uh, what geology do, the prim do these parameters describe, right? So there's a lot of complicated, but I want to make it clear, and, and, and uh, there's, there's no way, I uh, absolutely have no intention to move away from elegant, simple models. And the reason we want to understand the complications is not to make the model more complicated. The reason we want to understand the complications in reality is to make the model simpler. And, and to understand the basic physics, you have to understand um, complications. Only by understanding complications can you understand the governing underlying physics. So we need complex models for sure, especially for application purpose. But we need simple model to understand physics. And the last one, this will be very, very brief. So I, I'm, I'm finishing quite soon. Yeah, I know I'm uh, kind of running out uh, over time. Uh, uh, along, uh, about a, a strike direction, I think the first thing we need to <laughs> recognize and, and large, when you talk about large earthquakes, there are different types. And, and there are typically two end members, right? And there's two, Tohoku type, it's very, it's the same, same spatial scale, right? They're both their magnitude nine and above, right? Very large, but Tohoku type is very compact with very large slip and with very, very, very large local stress drop, not average. Average stress drop is similar. And, and for Sumatra, it's a, it's a very spread very long rupture. You see the, the, the source function right here, moment rate function. It, it takes a, a long time to complete rupture, and the slip is smaller. So that's, that's something we need to recognize. Now it's time to, uh, and to uh, talk about the uh, <laughs> some <laughs> rupture dynamics to understand this. And uh, large earthquakes all about rupture propagation. It's easy to produce earthquakes, right? You have earthquakes, small earthquakes, all the time. Right? If you have a good enough seismometer, you see seismicity all the time. But only very few of them can grow into big ones. So propagation is really the key. And, and so as we, uh, people in this room, most people in this room should know this very well. And at, at, uh, at the time of the earthquake, and the fall stress is some, some distance below yielding, right? And, the, and then when earthquake occurs, and uh, when the slip, slip uh, rupture front comes here, it'll raise the stress and cause failure, and, and then it will weaken dynamically. That's, that's the dynamic stress we need for frictional heating, and eventually uh, you have a, a final stress. So that's our a static stress drop. So all the, the false strength I talked about for seismogenic falls is really about this. It's not about the peak real strength. Real strength is about this strength. Okay, but that's important. That's, that's what, uh, what we care. Uh, and, and, and so what, uh, as modelers, as scientists, uh, that's what we really want to know, right? And, and, and uh, what uh, this uh, stress, uh, how close we are from the actual strength, right? That, that's the, that determines propagation, the different reasons, pro material properties and geometry, different reasons, right? But there's over, with a number of global compilations, the overwhelming evidence that suggests very large earthquakes are associated with a smooth incoming seafloor, and by inference, smooth contact. And the reason is, is, is quite simple, right? If you think about uh, uh, this kind of picture, and for a smooth fault, and if you have a, a fault strength like that, and a stress accumul accumulates, and eventually it'll rupture occurs. When rupture occurs, it, it can go a long way and more easily. And for a strike slip fault, it can 
actually it could go into a super shear, right? For, for, for a subduction fault or a slip direction and propagate, propagation direction is, is different, right? So we, we, we never get, get into super shear. Well, you get a super shear that way, but never in that way, but what kind of uh, 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 propagation speed, right? So it's, it's a lot of information we need to uh, uh, investigate. And for, for rough, fault and for heterogeneous fault, all about heterogeneity, heterogeneous fault, and if the fault strength like that, stress like that, and it's easier for the rupture to take place. It doesn't take very long to, to fail, but it, it, it is harder for the rupture to propagate. Okay, and that, that's about earthquakes. But strangely, the same thing happened without this physics, the same thing happened Similarly, very similar things happen to very slow slips, like ETS, this Cascadia. This, this is a very typical example. This is the example from one, one event. You see this is, a, oh, this is tremor and this is slip from, uh, from geodesy. And that's the propagation rate. It starts from somewhere in the middle and prop, propagates both ways. And the, the, the lines, it propagates in, at the speed of uh, something like uh, uh, eight kilometers per day. Right, fairly uniform, and Cascadia people know this. All they, they all know this, right? It's just a just a just fact of life there for our subduction zone, and it, it's a, the speed can change, and that's 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 from uh, uh, different observations from tremor migration, from GPS observations, where stream meters, and they all show the same pattern. You see the migrate, and that that's that's quite strange. And while some people uh, 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 straight and state mod, mod, uh, modeling can some models can produce this. And uh, but uh, if you talk about falls on rheology, how it really happens, it was still something to uh, a lot to learn. Uh, okay, and so that's about the propagation. But for the same subduction zone, we have a segmentation. Right? This is a, a nice example summary from uh, Japan Trench. Right? When you see this red, red, red is tremor. Tremor means tremor is a creep meter. Right? The, the fault is creeping, and and uh, and you can see, and we have a uh, creep zones there. And, and the, uh, uh, the zone that, that, that does not creep normally uh, produce that big earthquake. And the creep zones sometimes are related with, uh, with uh, a very rough incoming plate. That could be our uh, uh, strong creep areas. And, uh, and there are some examples of strong creep. And these are from geodetic. When you see red here, it's creeping. And, and we have a lot of creep here, a creep here with the, with the incoming complex, incoming geometric anomalies, and we have a, a creep in there. And uh, uh, so these are, 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 are examples of uh, uh, creep, but creep can happen not only because of very rough incoming plate, geometry, complex boson structure. It can creep for other reasons we don't fully understand. It can creep in a big way, like here, and in and, 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 uh, uh, Northern uh, Andes. And there's a zone that's over 800 kilometers long. That's been creeping. Geodetically, we can see it's been creeping. It, it's, 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 it, we don't know what's, what's happening there. It could be some geometrical effect, could be other things, could be hydrous minerals. We don't really know. And that's the size of that creep zone is comparable to a very large rupture zone. So, but unless we understand why faults creep, we do not really fully understand why faults produce earthquakes. Isn't that right? So we have to understand it. So the strike slip direction questions, why do the speed and length of rupture or slow slip propagation, what do the speed and length of the rupture propagation tell us about fault properties and recall super shear in strike slip faults. And how does hydrogenity control slip propagation and stress drop? And local stress drop versus average stress drop. And how does fault internal structure, fault zone material, and fluid control hydrogenity? And we have structural hydrogenity versus material hydrogenity. They are different things. And what is the wavelength spectrum of hydrogenity? And what conditions? facilitate long range uh, rupture or creep. I think I've uh, done my job and uh, uh, I've le I, I leave the, uh, this slide here and welcome questions. Thank you.